Okay, I'm live now. So, okay. All right, those of you that are there, come on in. Uh, Victoria. And Caitlin, good morning. Good morning, Millette, Alexis. Okay, let's see who we got here. Okay, Caitlin is here. And Millette. Morning, Monica. Let's see. Monica. <clears throat> Haley's here. Good morning, Haley. Good morning, Teresa. There you are. And Brandy. And Nicholas is here. Cody's here. And Amanda Rouse. Good morning, Amanda. Hannah, good morning. Okay, Cody, got you. And Rhonda, good morning, Rhonda. Thank you for asking there, Teresa. She's uh, a little better. She has what they call temporal arteritis. Arteritis. In other words, the arteries here that go up, the temporal, remember you've learned those bones, I think, in, in class, the temporal artery on either side, they are swollen for some reason. So they're putting her on prednisone. The doctor told her she might see a lot of mood swings. That's going to make it interesting around here. So <laughs> we'll see how it turns out, but I appreciate your prayers for that. At least we have some uh, direction in which to move and try to handle, handle the situation. Actually going to do 
let's see, today's Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday, Thursday afternoon. Yeah, Thursday afternoon, I've got to take her. They're going to do a little biopsy of that artery and see if they can uh, determine if they're on the right track. So I appreciate your, your prayers there. Mm. Well, she's so nice and slender now. We'll have to see if uh, what happens there. Thanks for warning me. All right, let's see. I think I've got everybody. Okay, I think we were in the I in chapter 15. Is that correct? I believe we were. Uh, Teresa, she had some severe headaches and her jaw ached. She also had some vision disturbances. Um, pretty miserable for a while. Taking a lot of uh, BC and a lot of Tylenol. Doctor told her not to take BC. BC is wonderful. I don't take it very often, but boy, it gets to you quick when you your joints ache or whatever. If you're going to go do work in the yard, you know. Alexis. Okay. Well, look in chapter 15. I think I think we might have been in the eye. The light in here is not the the um, the best. Look over in chapter fifteen on page uh, like five fifty five five fifty eight and so forth. I think we might have talked about the rods and the cones. 551, posed to start on cavities and chambers. Ah, here we go. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's look on page 551. And um, let's see, Joyce, are you in there yet? Joyce Barr, are you there? Somebody else might have another. Jalen might have another textbook, an edition that has a different page, just a couple of pages off or so. Okay, Jalen and Joyce are not there for whatever reason. Okay, so let's look on 551, and we're going to uh, wrap this up, I think, fairly quickly here um, in the eye, and we got to get back to chapter 12 because we have not covered the brain, and that's part of what needs to be covered in 210. So on page 551, you see the ch cavities and chambers. Now, one look right above that first column where you see cavities and chambers of the eye, and I want you to go right above it, and there's a sagittal section of an eye. 
It's a figure 1515. So as you look at the, right above the fi figure 1515, you see the little comment there, look right above, and you see anterior chamber and posterior chamber. Now, those two chambers make up what we call the anterior cavity. If you look at the little writing underneath there, you see it says anterior and posterior chambers form the anterior cavity. So as you look above and you see anterior chamber and posterior chamber, in the anterior chamber, that's the space between the cornea and the lens. Actually, the book says between the iris and the cornea. That's fine. You can say that between the iris and the cornea. It's anterior to the lens. Nothing wrong with that. And then there's another chamber called the posterior chamber. And that is a little space, very small space between the lens and the back of the iris. Do you remember your iris is that uh, the colored part of our eye, blue, brown, greenish, whatever, gray or whatever? It's a very slender uh, cavity in there, isn't it? Or chamber, rather. So the anterior chamber is in front of the iris, but behind the cornea. That's a little space there. And then the posterior chamber is a very small cavity between the lens and the back of the iris. Hey, Joyce. Oh, no. I didn't know you had cancer. I'm sorry you're having to go through that, Joyce. I am sorry. They took more of it. Are they going to leave stuff in there? Or can they not get to it? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and move on. I know it's a lot to answer right there, but um, I appreciate your commitment to being here. I hope it'll encourage you today to know people are going to be praying for you. And uh, Wow. Pretty tough, aren't you? That's good. I appreciate your perspective on that but we'll be praying for you. Matter of fact, let me write that down right now. Glad you let us know that, Joyce. Amen. Hmm. Okay. So let's look at that anterior cavity. And you now know the two little chambers that are in there. Now, <clears throat> you see the little white arrows between the lens and the back of the iris. And then you see the little arrowhead go through the pupil, that little opening. And then it goes down. Well, what they're referring to there is aqueous humor. There's a liquid that the ciliary body, if you look up at the very top of the illustration, you see the term ciliary body. 
And that produces this liquid called aqueous humor. Some people say aqueous, and that's okay. <clears throat> and so it makes that fluid, and you see the arrows, and that's the direction of the flow of the fluid. And that fluid, of course, is there to, to make sure that, hello there, Nabi, glad you're here. Let me write that down. Okay, 20. I don't know. Here we go. Twenty-five gotcha. So you see there's a fluid there made by the ciliary body and you see the little white arrows. They go between the lens and they go behind the iris, between the lens and the iris. Then they come out the pupil and then they go all, all around in that anterior chamber. And then they're absorbed by, <clears throat> you see it says scleral venous sinus. Scleral venous sinus. That's where that fluid goes. And so it's circulated uh, over the surface of the lens, over the surfaces, the posterior and the anterior surfaces of the iris. Has a certain pressure in there. Now, some of you um, either wear glasses or you wear contacts, and you may have gone to an optician. Uh, or an ophthalmologist, and they shoot a puff of air onto your cornea. They're checking for what they call intraocular pressure. Now, when I was a medic in the military and we would give physicals to guys, uh, they had an instrument about that tall, and we'd put a little anesthetic on their cornea, and we would put that instrument right on their cornea, and that's how we measured the pressure in the eye. Of course, things have gotten more technical and maybe more accurate. But anyway, that's how you de determine if you have glaucoma. They're looking for a high intraocular pressure. And so that's, that's a couple of ways they uh, used to check that pressure. So the fluid is produced by the ciliary body. It flows all in that anterior cavity made of two chambers, posterior and anterior. And then the fluid goes back into the circulatory system. And of course, we're making it all day long. Don't have to think about it. Aren't you glad we don't have to think about it? so many functions in this body that allows us to enjoy, like I did, I had a Oatmeal cookie with uh, raisins in it and walnuts and some peanut butter on it and a cup of coffee. It's good. So we can think about enjoying the, the breakfast and not have to worry about the pressure in our eye. All right, so that's your anterior cavity. So if you get too much pressure, you get a condition called glaucoma. I think diabetes is one of those conditions that can sort of elevate that pressure. You can actually go blind with with too much pressure. Now, that anterior cavity, we're working our way on that diagram from the left to the right. And so when you get behind the lens, you're into what is called the posterior cavity. And you can see um, to the right of that illustration, you see uh, toward the bottom, vitreous humor in posterior cavity that is sort of a jelly-like material that helps keep the, uh, the neural layer, which is the retina, against the choroid. 
This is not the time to ask that, Alexis. We're in the middle of this. And yeah, I'm glad you know it's off topic, but we'll, we can do that in a little bit. <clears throat> so that vitreous humor is like a little bit of jelly, and it helps keep that retina against the choroid coat because it's a layer of nervous tissue that picks up uh, colors and light and so forth. Now, while we're still on that page, while we're still on that page, you look up at the top of page 551, you see cataracts. So I want you to read that. That's a problem that happens in a lot of people's eyes simply because they get older and uh, the the lens becomes a little bit cloudy. It's just something that people get at various points in their lives. So you want to read about that, and you want to come down and read about glaucoma. Basically, what you want to understand about glaucoma is that it's a situation, as you see in the second line, it says the aqueous humor cannot drain and fluid builds up in the anterior cavity, those two chambers, and that excess fluid raises the pressure inside the eyeball. So you don't want that pressure. It, the pressure can damage the nervous layer, the neural layer, the retina. And then, of course, you can go blind. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's go over to page 554. And I want you to look on uh, the second column. And you see these terms, presbyopia, hyperopia, and myopia. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to read that, not now. But it's talking about when it says emetropia, uh, that means that the uh, the eye is in good shape. It's not elongated or shortened. It's in good shape, and so your vision is sharp. Now you come down under emetropia, which is in the second paragraph, that second column, second paragraph. You see emetropia, emetropia, and then you see hyperopia called farsightedness. And then you look on the next page and you see uh, in the first column myopia, which is nearsighted. So make sure you read that. And then you have astigmatism, a situation where the cornea surface of the cornea is ir irregular. Now, on page 555, on page 555, you see in the second column, photoreceptors. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail of these. These are beautiful little cells. It's amazing how they're built. But what you want to note here is you look at the picture on the, uh, figure 1521. They call it layers of the retina. You see where light is down at the bottom. Light comes in a particular way. And, of course, it looks like it comes down to 
uh, the bottom there on the diagram. So all that conglomeration of things like the pigmented layer of the retina and the rods and the cones and the horizontal cells, don't go learn all of those, okay? Don't go learn all of those. But I do want you to be able to recognize are the rods and the cones. The tissue is very complicated. And as you look in the second column under photoreceptors and the retina, come down to the last couple of lines. It says, as noted, the two types of photoreceptors are cones and rods. You probably knew that. Might have even learned that. In, uh, but the cones enable us to see colors. And boy, how many do, how many colors and variations of colors do we have? So, so you look on 556, 556, first column, and you see the the bold print term says rods. Rods do not enable you to see color, but you see they it says they're very sensitive and they're capable capable of responding to less light. Now, I want you to come down about five lines from rods. Let's see, starting with rods is one, two, three, four, uh, five. Come down to the fifth line. And you remember we talked about the fovea centralis. That's the center of your uh, retina. That's where you have the most, the highest number of cones to pick up uh, all the light and the color and so forth. Notice this in the sentence, as you move outward away from the fovea, the concentration of cones decreases until at the very edge of the retina, no cones are found at all. Okay. And then it says, conversely, there are about 100 million rods out there in that area, but none in the fovea. Hello, Jalen. Catch you in a minute here in terms of being present. Or if you want to use the word perimeter, uh, edge of the retina, that's okay. Um, You've got a lot of rods out there, but no cones. But in the center of the retina, which is the fovea centralis, you've got lots of cones and no rods. So if we have a clear night tonight and you want to play with this, and you may have already recognized this, if you get outside sometime and you're looking at some stars that are sort of faint, um, I think they call call one little group of stars out there the Pleiades, and um, they're a long way, light years from Earth. And you can see them, but if you look directly at them, they will disappear because they're faint in giving off their light. Not because they're not bright, but they're just more um, more distance than say something like Venus, which is in our solar system. So if you look to the side one way or the other, then your rods will pick up the faint light and you will see them. So if you have some time, just go out and enjoy a little bit of looking at the, the heavens and um, look at some uh, stars that don't give up much light, and you'll see that you see them better when you turn your eye just a little bit to the right or to the left, because that's where the rods are, and they pick up the low light. One of the things they taught us in the military when we were learning how to fire at people coming at us is you don't look straight at them because they disappear, because there's not enough light to stimulate 
the cones. So you look to the side and then you have to aim as best you can your weapon, but you can see them. You can see the shadow of them and you aim toward the shadow. So they knew the rods were out on the edge of our, um, our retina. Now, before we close this out in terms of the, uh, the photoreceptors, we're on page 556. And you look down to that first column and you come to the heading that says structure of photoreceptors. So you come down into photoreceptors and what I want you to do is basically read the second and the third pigments, rhodopsin, opsin, retinol. And then you come down into the second pair of uh, the third paragraph it says like rods, cones are named, da, 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 da. iodopsin, iodopsin and a protein called photopsin. Now you see how we're getting, we continue to run into all these different sorts of proteins. What's the difference between uh, the pigment, uh, let's see, what's it, the protein opsin versus photopsin? Well, like I ask you on a test, and I'm trying to get you to think about that, you know, that, the type of amino acids that make it up, the sequence of the amino acids, the number of the amino acids, the shape of the protein, so the key have the chemical difference, which affects the shape and the shape determines what the protein does. You alter the shape and the protein doesn't work. Okay. Trying to get you to put some things together. And of course, how do these proteins come into existence? They come in through pro, uh, protein synthesis. So you got to have the ribosomes, the ER and so forth. And you've got to have the code there and the DNA. Wonderful. Fascinating. Mana, Ma, Mallory, I'll get to that in a moment, okay? I'm not going to stop here on this lecture. Hang in there. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go back to Chapter 12. Go back to Chapter 12, and that is 425 we're looking at. Thank you, Mallory. Okay, 425. Central nervous system. And of course, when you think of the central nervous system, you think of the brain and spinal cord. That's great. What we're going to do is go a little deeper into the structures of those two components of the central nervous system. So as you look on page 425, second column, Jalen, I'm not sure what uh, page that is on. If you have a textbook, Joyce is in the hospital uh, having some cancer removed. She does not have a textbook to keep the rest of us on. Um, on, on target. Uh, that's so far as I'm at that point, Teresa, 15, that's all we're going to be covering now. I'm a, I'd like to get to the ear, but um, we got to come back here to this. I just skipped it. and My boss says I need to do this first. Okay. So as we're looking on 425, you see that second column there says the brain, and it talks about it being soft, and, and you know, it's protected by the cranium. And you guys have learned the bones of the cranium. You've learned the sutures of the cranium. And so as you come down, as you come down, starting with the brain, you come down one, two, three, four, five, six. And when you see line six, it says it has internal cavities. We do have holes in our brain. 
but they're there by design. It's not that you've lost anything. But you see, it says we have internal cavities called ventricles. Now, all of you, when you think of a ventricle, you think of a heart, don't you? That's a cavity, a lower cavity as opposed to an atrium. So you want to know that they're cavities. We're going to get to those cavities and talk about them a little bit. And notice it says they are filled with the protective cerebrospinal fluid. Some of you may know people or maybe you've had it done where they've taken a little cerebrospinal fluid uh, from your lower back and they want to study it. They want to see are there any, any critters in there that should not be there. That fluid should be sterile in the sense of viruses and bacteria. Of course, you can't see viruses in there. Viruses are too small, but you can see bacteria. So if somebody has meningitis, they can look in there and if it's a bacterial meningitis, they can see those bacteria. If it's a viral meningitis, you can't see that because the viruses are too small and much smaller than the bacteria. All right, so we got cerebrospinal fluid in those ventricles, and we're going to get to look at those ventricles. There are actually four of them, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. Now, as you look at the second paragraph, you see it says the brain is richly supplied with blood vessels. Indeed, uh, during rest, about 20% of the total blood flow to the body goes to the brain. So a lot of activity. Of course, you know we all dream and so forth, so we're thinking and using oxygen and glucose to do that. Now come down to the one, two, third paragraph, and you see the brain consists of four divisions, four components. Now each of those components can have subcomponents, so to speak. So you see it says the brain has four divisions, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Now you probably are, um, I guess you've been into the brain already in terms of models. I don't know if you've uh, actually gotten to take an, uh, a sheep brain or a cow brain or something like that. Take a look at it. But um, anyway, here they list the four components below there. You see in bold print cerebrum. So I want you to read about the cerebrum. Largest part of the brain. You see it's composed of two hemispheres. You see those bold print terms. And each hemisphere has five lobes. And you probably had to know those, I guess, for your, is it your last lab test that you're taking, I believe. And you come on down after you see the, the, uh, the fact that it says you got five lobes, and we'll talk about them in just a minute. But notice it says this overall statement. The cerebrum is responsible for our higher mental functions. You and I are engaged in higher mental functions at this moment. Now, just sitting down and uh, eating a hamburger or something, we don't always involve our higher mental uh, faculties. But in this case, or if you're taking, right, trying to write an English essay or you're trying to work out Math 110 or something like that, that's when you start using the higher mental faculties. And you see there it talks about uh, learning, memory, personality, cognition. That's a big word for, for thinking. And you see language and so forth. All right, so those are general functions of the cerebrum. So if we damage the cerebrum, depending on where that damage has occurred, has occurred then we affect our memory. My wife has a friend whose wife uh, got t some sort of a tick fever, and uh, she lost a lot of her memory. She has had to rebuild uh, her memory in terms of some of the basic things that you and I take for granted. That we look at a lamp and we say, oh, I know what a lamp does. You know, it puts out light. You got to have a bulb inside it, got to have power to it. And she didn't know that. 
It's like a little kid. And you have to start imprinting information back into her brain. And she has regained some of those faculties. But um, tough situation sometimes when that, when that occurs. A virus could cause that. A little bacterium could cause it. There's some little that can get in the brain cells and create problems. Then you see the diencephalon. Now, let's do this. Let's look on page 426 for just a moment. We're looking at figure 12.1. Twelve dot one. Now, as you you see a nice picture, got a lot of color to it. Of course, ours doesn't have this, but we use color to separate things. And you see over to the right it says brain division. You, you see the cerebrum points to what looks like a tangle full of worms or so forth. So um, you look over to the right, performs higher mental functions, interprets sensory stimuli. You are interpreting my voice. I happened to go to a wedding one time uh, up in Wilmington. One of our kinfolk got married up there, and they invited us. And, and uh, they were taking pictures, and there was this gentleman out in the audience. And I couldn't really recognize him or anything like that. But as soon as he opened his mouth, I said, I know that voice. And I'd seen him on television. He was an actor in several things. And I recognize the quality of his voice. So you interpret sensory stimuli and then you do planning and so forth and initiates movement that's involved. We'll get into some other parts that are involved with movement. Now, uh, okay, good. Thank you, Alexis. If you've got, a, if any of you got a different book, Jalen, she, uh, Alexis says that 424 is in the new book. If anyone needs the page. That's great. Thanks, Alexis. Appreciate that. Okay, you come down to the diencephalon, and there it is. It's that sort of purplish structure. And there are a couple of things in there that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, but you see the general function over there. Processes information, relays information, integrates it, gives it a foundation to be drawn from and so forth. Uh, homeostasis. A lot of homeostatic mechanisms take place in the diencephalon. That would be where the control center is. We talked about temperature in the body. Well, the control center is in that area. So as you look back on Page 425, or the pre page preceding that illustration, you go to diencephalon. It says buried beneath the cerebral hemispheres is the central core of the brain called the diencephalon. Consists, I say, die would make us think too, wouldn't it? But you see, it says there are four distinct structural parts. A little confusing there, but you see it says basically the same thing, relaying information, and there it is, homeostatic mechanisms. Regulation of movement and biological rhythms. A biological rhythm would be kind of like your uh, uh, sleep cycle and your awake cycle. Then you come down, now we're still on page 425 or previous to the, um, the picture there. So you know where that diencephalon is. You come down there and you see cerebellum. Got a posterior and an inferior uh, portion of the brain. Cerebellum. Composed of right and left hemispheres. Look over on page... Um, 426, or uh, let's see, Alexis says it's 424 in the a new edition. And you see the term cerebellum, and you see that pink area, or whatever color you ladies want to call it. Y'all are better at that than I am. You 
You look over to the right, it monitors and coordinates movement. And you and I are moving, unless we're asleep, we're usually moving all during the day. We're holding our head up. We're, I'm waving with a pencil here. Mouth is running. Uh, change my position. The cerebellum actually helps us. Um, and I think I've mentioned this before. Think of, uh, let's see, what's our Simone Biles? The cerebellum is very active in all of those twists and somersaults that she does and lands perfectly on the mat. People who are into um, doing those dives in the Olympics, you know, the two and a half flips and a twist or whatever like that, that helps to coordinate that movement. Same thing would be in the track, uh, people running and so forth, handing off a baton or pole vaulters. So you see where the cerebellum is. It's under the uh, we would call it the occipital lobe of the uh, the cere uh, cerebrum. So it's underneath there. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. And in brainstem, back on page 425, or the, the page beforehand, you see the brainstem. Now... <clears throat> They have a, an idea here that this brain just sort of came together by chance. Uh, I would uh, not accept that statement any more than I'd say this computer that's uh, transporting my picture just showed up on my back porch one day. Um, you got to have a maker to put this kind of stuff together. It's too intricate. It's too engineered. It's got its purposes and it works beautifully for the most part. So you see the brain stem. You don't have to worry about it being the older uh, part of the brain, but you see it connects. Here's one of the big functions of the brain stem, connects the brain and the spinal cord. So there is one function of the brain stem. And the brain stem's got several features, several parts in it, stru structures in it that we'll talk about a little bit later. As you look on page 425 or 424, Depending on your edition, when you see in about the third line down, functions include basic involuntary homeostatic functions. Again, sort of like a reflex arc. You don't have to think about it. It just maintains your body, and you don't have to think about that. And let's see. It goes on to talk about reflexes, monitoring movement. Okay. And then, of course, you come down to the spinal cord at the bottom of page 424. Well, well, well let's go look at the brain stem uh, before we get out of here. So you look on page 426 or 424, uh, depending on your edition, and you look at that figure 12-1, and you see the brain stem's got a line going to this purple structure. That whole structure, not just where the purple, uh, where the line goes. But that whole structure got three, three or four parts that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And it basically says the same thing over here on 426 or 424 when it talks about the function. So that's an overall view. And that's a fair amount of information, isn't it? And all these parts work together by chance, kind of like the engine in your car, right? It just all happened to come together. Okay, then you look at the bottom of page 425 and you see it says the spinal cord. Long tubular organ encased within and protected by the vertebral um, cavity. Now, it's in the cavity, but the bone around it, of course, offers some protection. We'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, not today necessarily, but we'll get somewhere closer to it. Now, you already know about the skull. You see it says the spinal cord in the second line. It begins at the foramen magnum, the big hole. Bottom of the skull. Out comes that um, brain stem. Once it's free from the skull, it's called the spinal cord.
and that spinal cord runs down as a, excuse me, pretty much a solid mass of tissue, neural tissue, uh, down to, if you look on the next page, where you have that illustration, 12.1, goes down to the lumbar vertebra. And there, as a solid cord, it ends, but you have nerves that go down past L2. They call it the cauda, which means tail, equina, which means horse, or the horse's tail. Now, as you look under that illustration, figure 12-1, and you look at the first column, as you come into that paragraph, which starts with lumbar vertebrae, I want you to come down one, two lines from there, and you see in the middle it says, like the brain, the spinal cord has an internal cavity with cerebrospinal fluid, and they call that cavity the central canal. Now we'll get to look at that a little bit later. Let's see, what's today, Tuesday? Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm going to be here Tuesday morning. Got to take my wife down there to the hospital on th Thursday afternoon. So, But I'll be here in the morning. Sorry I was late, got tied up with a colleague in terms of a situation that's developing. Now, as you look at the second paragraph, it says the brain and the spinal cord. We're still on page 426 under the picture. And you come down that first column and second paragraph. First column, second paragraph. Both the brain and the spinal cord consist of white matter and gray matter. Now, if you will look below, you will see a frontal section of the brain. And you'll see where it is labeled gray matter and then white matter over to the right. Now, what's the difference between gray matter and white matter, at least physically or visibly? What determines whether it's white matter or gray matter? That's correct, Monica. Myelination. The white matter, that's myelinated axons. And now you see, I can go on with another question. Well, what cell or how does that myelin come to be around uh, an axon? And you'd have to say, well, there's a cell that produces that myelin. What is myelin made out of? See, and you can just go on and on. See, you want to be able to think like that, too. Just start working your way through that sphere of information dealing with gray matter or white matter. And, of course, down here it says, um, if you look at the last sentence in that, sec that second paragraph, each lobe of the cerebrum contains bundles of white matter called tracts. That's good, Monica. That's correct. Schwann cells. Got two ends on it, I think. Um, bundles of white matter called tracts. And you re keep reading. It says that receive input and send output to the different cl clusters of cell bodies and dendrites in the cerebral gray matter. And that is called, those are called um, nuclei, gray matter. Somebody tells somebody, said, boy, you're kind of thin on the gray matter, aren't you? Well, and what they're doing is they're saying you're not very intelligent. Or you're at least you're not thinking or you're not using your gray matter. So it's a lot of way um, people sometimes talk to their kids like that. Come on, you got to use your gray matter. Now, in the second column, 
This is just general at this point. We'll get to some specifics a little bit later. In the second column, under figure 12-1, you see it says the spinal cord consists internally of gray matter containing nuclei that process information, as well as tracts of white matter that shuttle this information to and from the brain. So as you look at the illustration below, you see the gray matter, the spinal gray matter looks somewhat like a butterfly or a moth. And then you see the white matter surrounds that. So you got a general picture there. We've only just begun. So look on page 428. Uh, Alexis, you can tell us what page that is, if you would, maybe about 426 or something. But we're looking at section 12.2. And it says the brain. Now, we've already covered the brain to some degree. We understand that. We're going to get a little deeper into it. So as you look on page 428, and you're looking at section 12.2. Thank you, Alexis. 425, she says. It says the brain come down to these uh, pictures. You see, it looks like there's an illustration on the left, and you've got a picture on the right, the same thing. Uh, well, these other three look like the diagrams. The first and second one over there to the right looks like a picture of the real brain. So you want to know these marks, these landmarks, these divisions on the surface of the cerebrum. So as you look at that first picture, on the left, you see all these terms that identify yes, it's actually it's 12:4 in this book, Alexis. Yeah. So you, you can certainly see on the brain the bold print term that says, if you got a frontal lobe and a parietal lobe, well, what divides it? Well, let's look at look at the uh, curves on the brain, and I want you to locate a depression that's called a sulcus. It's kind of like a little valley or a dish, you know, whatever you want to say. Uh, central sulcus. Now you see it's a you can see a shadowy line. It's like a little crevice. Most of you know about a crevice. Uh, that's a like a ditch that goes from one side to the other. And in front of that sulcus, they'll call that the central sulcus. So in front of that sulcus, there is a raised area. Anytime you got a ditch or a valley, you got to have a mountain. You got to have some higher ground. If everything's level, you don't have ditches. So the sulcus is kind of like a dish, central, sort of divides the brain into the front half and the back half. And the raised area, would, which would be to your left, that's called a precentral gyrus. So the elevations, and I'm probably telling you stuff that uh, your lab teacher, whoever it is, Mr. Boggs or Mr. Davis, um, would tell you those raised areas, each one is called a gyrus. Some of you maybe have had a gyroscope when you were a kid. You could spin that, pull that thing with that uh, that uh, string, and it would sit there and whirl, you know. So I don't know how they got gyro out of this. But anyway, that's what they've done. So it's been working for years, so that's, we'll stick with it. So that raised area right in front of the central sulcus is called a precentral gyrus. Now you look below precentral gyrus and you see now that you're into a particular lobe of the cerebrum. And I, you guys might have had to know this uh, in your lab. 
So, you know, a frontal lobe, we'll talk about the various um, functions there. Let's look over here to page 429, the facing page, or depending on how your book is or, or, um, put together, it might be the next page. There's a section in the first column that says lobes of the cerebrum. So you see it says five lobes of each cere cerebral hemisphere as follows. Now, frontal lobe, that's what we just looked at, the frontal lobe. And I want you to read that <clears throat> section. The last sentence says the neurons of the frontal lobe are, are responsible for planning, executing. In other words, some of you guys got those little books, you know, and I have them too, to write things down, what we're going to accomplish today or hope to accomplish. And you see it says it's for planning and movement, complex mental functions such as behavior, conscience, personality, uh, understanding anatomy, working out algebra, and so forth. Okay, so make sure you know that. And then you come back to the picture, and you see you have that central sulcus again, and you look to the, in this case, to the right, you've got another raised area called the post-central gyrus. That is the parietal lobe. You remember you had a parietal bone on either side. And so again, you look over on page 429 where it says lobes of the cerebrum. And you see parietal lobes posterior to the frontal lobes, pair of them. And you look at the last sentence, neurons of the parietal lobe are responsible for uh, processing and integrating sensory information and function. Sensory information. Picking up environmental signals in the environment. Now let's go back to the picture, picture uh, figure 12-4. Oh, I'm running over. It's like, and I hope you can hang in there for just a minute. Uh, you see on the left, come down under frontal lobe, you see to the left of that says lateral fissure, and then you see temporal lobe. I'm just going to tell you to read just like we've been doing, go over there on the next page and um Look at what the functions of the temporal lobe are. And then go over and come back to the picture. And you see on the right hand side, you see occipital lobe. And you come back over to uh, page 429, and you find out that's in, involved with vision. And then you look at the very bottom right of the picture, figure 12.4. You see the um, uh, retractors pulling the elm at the lateral fissure there. Fissure being a uh, deep ditch, so to speak. Shulcus is a shallow one. You see the insula. Can you imagine seeing some of these diagrams on a test? And then you look over to the next page or to the right, and you see it says insula is near paired and um, talks about they currently are thought to have functions relating to taste and to our internal organs. We do not know everything. We know, know enough to help some people in some fashion, but we do not have it all down. A lot of knowledge, yeah, but there's a, a huge can full of it. Okay, and then on back on page uh, 428, figure 12, 4, 
don't forget that you've got uh, um, a fisher down the middle and they do not, let's see, do they label that? Mm, yeah, they say, yep, you can see it, that line, longitudinal fisher. It's over on, you're looking at the bottom images and you look to the left image and over on the right of the left hand image, you see right hemisphere longitudinal fissure. Okay. And as I said a minute ago, we've only just begun. All right. Now, you had a couple of questions. Let's see. What have I got here? Let me start up here at the top. Okay. Alexa says, does anyone know what lecture test five is? Well, we're building that information at this point, Alexis. So when you start thinking about studying for this, and you can see, you can't just go over this the night before. you got to have this stuff in your head. So lecture test five will uh, be uh, composed of, of the central nervous system. We'll also get into a little bit more detail of the peripheral nervous system in chapter 13. And... And we'll do the, I think you, have you guys, uh, you guys knew them, I think you had to know the cranial nerves. So we'll look at the, uh, uh, the peripheral nervous system. And then in chapter 14, that's a view of the autonomic nervous system. So we are, we got to cover some ground here. So that's that as well as the I will be on lecture test five. That's my understanding, Alexis, that all the homework grades compiled as a test grade. And we're going to do 13 and 14. Don't forget that. My understanding is that I've got to ask Mr. Malakowski. Now, that wasn't totally clear in the syllabus that uh, he gave me to put on, on the website. So I will see if I can find the, the relationship between um how the lab counts in, how the homework quizzes came in, come in. But I think you're on the right track, Alexis. Okay, and let's see. Monica, you have just mentioned for the test, will you be sending out a study guide? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, uh, I have not sent you one yet, but I will. Um, I can do that today as soon as we get through here. I've uh, outlined some of this and put it together. And I will shoot that um, Word document to you. I'll have it dropped in your box, um, you know, on that uh, email stuff. And you can open it up, save it, print it. So the week where we would normally have our exams, and but we've had this problem with the virus, uh, it's going to be a week later for your exam. So I think we've got a little bit of leeway in there. So I think uh, by... Probably next week we'll probably be finishing up with test five's material, I think. Okay. And I'll ship you this immediately. Got my little flash drive here. That light kind of blow, uh, blows things out, doesn't it? And I'll send uh, each of you a copy through the email in D2L. Okay. All right, I'm going to turn this off and get busy, busy sending these things to you. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Um, Teresa, as far as I know at this point, just the eye will be uh, out of chapter, chapter 15. I'd hope to do a little bit of the ear, but I don't know if we've got time to do it. Tiffany. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it, kiddo. Okay. Let's see, 21. All right. Um, 
No, no, no. Did you hear me, Jerkita? Finals are not next week. Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, we haven't covered all the material we need to cover. We'll probably have the fifth test during that week of finals. Where we normally have a final, we'll have the fifth test. Um, let's see. Well, we'll just keep meeting. We, all we're doing is extending the semester, so we'll continue to meet on Tuesday and Thursday at 9.30 until we get this material done. Uh, let's see. Millette. Uh, let me check and see if I, I think I got yours. I just haven't gotten to it. Okay. I'll do those things. I'll look at your email, Millette, and may not be able to answer it all completely, but I'll look at it, and I'm also going to send you that Word document. Okay? Probably the week after regular finals, Ramsey. That's when we'll probably have our final. Okay? See you guys later.